my wife that's like messaging with um, her uh, sister and a friend of mine and I'm just like why why okay so let me just play the intro because this is going to destroy the whole stream for everybody that <laughs> watches the replay so intro and then I'm going to talk about the quest sorry in this video we're going to talk about documentary editing how do you build up a strong story that can evoke emotions in people. I'm Johnny von Wallström and my last film The Pearl of Africa sold to Netflix. But now let's just start the show. All right so how do you build up a story? So it all comes down to the quest and I think it's uh, Robert McKee talks about the quest as kind of like the essence of what a story is and to me it's essentially you taking the audience on a journey which is basically you build up this story world, whatever it is, Kino, which we're going to look at, um, which I'm editing right now, is pretty much a story about like this town that's bothered by mining. And the whole story is about like what this conflict is doing to this community there. And when you take a viewer on that quest for answers and understanding the story, it's basically building up these teases of what the answer to this question is, like how will they survive or what's going to happen to the little town that's threatened by the big mining corporation. Yeah, are they going to get along? What's going to happen? What you need to kind of focus on is to bring that out of, of the material. And I think that's kind of easy to understand. But the quest in itself is taking the audience on that journey so that they feel like they're there watching or, or kind of living that whole thing. Uh, and to do that, you need to build like scenes, which we've been editing before uh, in this uh, live editing session. And basically you build up these scenes to embody that conflict, that story, that quest in a cinematic way. So instead of having like interviews that drives the, uh, the story forward or action forward, you need to build these scenes that really show off like everything. And if you can kind of do that effectively, you're going to get more emotions from people when they're watching. Uh, everything so I think that's what it basically comes down to and then you take the viewers on this journey to discover this uh, and you have to kind of let them think for themselves you can't just like start with uh, the whole journey and then take them on that journey and, and answer everything for them they also need to question things try to figure things out give them like a little bit of the answer but then you try to twist that and surprise them all the time and then when you do that with the cinematic language being, you know, everything from action to uh, whatever you're like composing in a shot, recording in audio, could be like interviews as well, but it's how you assemble the thing together that becomes the cinematic storytelling. It's not like one thing that's cinematic. You can't call one shot cinematic. It's never going to be that. It, the cinematic thing uh, of any storytelling is how you assemble things and make it cinematic in terms of like how do you get people to understand a world through the cinematic language that you're speaking which is like everything all the tools that you have but it's not an interview and it's not a shot and it's not audio it's how you put it together that becomes cinematic essentially uh, yeah cinematic language of arts people it's not that hard to understand. So don't go looking at those 120 frames per second and thinking that that's the definition of cinematic. Uh, but anyway, I got this question from Hampus Brink. When filming a documentary, you may be filming a lot because you don't really know how to cut it together. How do you sort all that clips and uh, how do you easily know which clips are which, like metadata, how do you organize it? But it's not only that, uh, it's also like on a bigger level, like how do you actually get into a program? How do you actually start to tell a story is, is what I'm reading this question as uh, mainly, because when you look at it, 
when I film anything today, like this didn't used to be the case, but I know what I'm after when I'm filming something today. And that comes with experience and, and being like used to tell stories. Yeah. And I put a lot of effort into like the research phase. I put a lot of effort into what scenes do we shoot? I, I direct everything without like being there. Like even now we're shooting in Kino City and I'm actually directing it from here. So somebody else is going there and shooting it. And, and it's just that like this occasion I can't go. Uh, and then we have to get this uh, event that is like a story event that's crucial to show the story. And then we have to send somebody else. And then you really need to know what you're directing, what scenes do you want? And that's what you get from experience, I think. And that's what the editing part of storytelling is all about, like knowing what scenes you're after. Uh, so today I would think about it in, in this uh, way. Let me show you the screen here with the scenes. So why aren't you showing the screen? Let me see. Rizal, where are you? Screen. I promise it worked a second ago. <laughs> How annoying. Where is the screen? The window. Oh, there we go. Okay, so when we talk about scenes, we have this canoe scene here, which basically it's it's just like you could see this as like just a regular scene where like we shot this, we we went out, we started shooting him going with this canoe. Uh, it's just a scene with a guy that's going out canoeing. But that's not really the intent here. The intent is like to have this whole scene to show him going out in, in nature to in a cinematic way capture the environmental conflict that is here where you have like water is polluted. So the water in Kino City has arsenic in it. By having this scene take place there, you have a natural way of, of kind of showing stuff in a cinematic way uh, to kind of capture that conflict without having to like show it through interviews. That's the reasoning why like this scene was shot. So I always knew that that was why we were going to the place to ride a canoe or to capture that. Like I would be happy anything that we got in nature where we have like this this conflict. It just so happened that he was riding a canoe and that was what he did and he was fishing. So in a way it just made perfect sense story-wise. But then when you shoot it you might not look at it that way where you just shoot the canoe in the water because that's going to be pretty boring to, to kind of watch. So the way we kind of structure the whole sequence is, is basically just like the whole scenario. We start filming from leaving his house all the way there. We walk out because there's a nice place outside. We try also to think about like how do we mix up scenes so maybe we can get like a thinking scene here that we can use somewhere but we don't really know where but we know that we need him in nature to be able to tell the story of the conflict that is like inherent in this place that we're filming. So then we shoot this whole scenario of him going there, like packing up his canoe on his roof of his car and then going out and paddling. And then we do like an impromptu interview in the canoe. But mainly it's just about capturing like a fly on the wall aesthetics of that uh, sequence. Uh, and then another scene that I'm going to start looking at and editing today, I thought, is at his home which is a good example of the same thing where like, we went out and we started filming him at his home thinking that like, okay, this will be pretty much him being at his home and we want to show him as a character and, and all that. 
uh, and he's playing his guitar and, and it's just like an introduction to him as a character. But now when like we were going and leaving there, we understood that like he's actually maybe about to move. And that's also something that's part of the whole conflict in the whole uh, town that we're filming. The conflict is all about like him actually being there in his place having to maybe have to move because he's being bullied. So by being there and being in his home you can start to show like him being there and then later on catch up with him having to move, having to build the scenario up so you don't think about it in like okay now I'm in his home it's nice it looks really pretty let's just shoot something with him. That's not how I'm thinking of it. I'm always thinking in like okay so this scene is about him and it's about him being in his home and this is his safe space. So we try to capture that, him being like in that uh, type of headspace. Uh, and then you try to picture that and show his daily life. And now like with time, his whole story has taken a turn and now he has to move because somebody else bought the place is being forced out. So now he's actually about to move this week and we're actually there filming that, uh, but I'm not there. Yeah, so then we have this scenario building up towards him having to leave and with that you have a story and, and I've always seen his story as like okay this is possibly a version of being a refugee but on a, like a microcosm scale in this place. So then you need to figure out like what type of scenes actually can show that and then you need to try to build up and build towards those story events which all scenes should ideally be story events. And if you can kind of build that up, you're going to have a much stronger impact with your material and that's how it becomes cinematic. It doesn't become cinematic because you're shooting it in a certain style. It becomes it when you put your audience there and they understand the story and they live this story with you, uh, the filmmaker or the people that are in the film. Uh, and that's what you should like approach it as not shooting everything, having a lot of material that you don't know how to assemble. Now I don't know how this is going to fit into the story, like where is this scene going to be, but I do understand story-wise where does this fit into the story. And that's what I think is essential. Then like organizing it is just down to like structuring it in bins and stuff. And that I can show you right now. So the way that this is structured, I have a long video on this uh, and I have a template on our uh, Learn Documentary website, but basically I just have like this structure here, which is kind of color coded. So you have this VFX, that's just visual effects. This is my template, so it's just a standard thing that I use for every project. I have versions, which is basically the, the projects that I'm editing. For instance, now it's trailers, but it could be something else. Uh, it could be episodes, could be a whole film. I have templates, which is basically just templates that I use to get started and not have to sound mix everything all the time. I have the synced video files, which is basically just the synced uh, timeline. And then from that, I take it into selects and I do like rough cut. Um, versions of that just cutting out like all the stuff that's crap then comes the scenes which is the next step and there i cut down to just the scenes uh, which is what we've been editing and then like this is just multicam it's the masters when i export things and it's compound clips sound effects outputs like actually masters and compound and no actually masters should be here so i'll just move it for you so you can see <laughs> and then you have music and then media is where I organize everything that I ingest. So you got voiceover, you got the scenes. Uh, let me just put this together so you can see. So I got the scenes and then I have for each character and the folders for that. And then I have the interviews. Then I have episodes, which is old episodes that we did the behind the scenes series. This is just because I've put stuff into this because uh, I needed the timelines and then I need to organize it somewhere. So behind the scenes is here. That's basically like how I would go about organizing uh, all the material. I would put them in a B-roll folder. I would put assets there. I would usually put everything in so that it's easy to uh, to kind of understand where like everything goes. Uh, that's super important to 
to have a quick way of organizing it. And it's not that hard to keep track of if you have that organization. And in terms of how I organize it in, uh, in Finder, could be a PC that you work on, but I would actually go about it in a way where I have a template. I do that as well. I have a template for each project. Um, I don't know if I can show. It's basically similar to this, but it, it's a folder structure, which is similar to how I organize stuff here. But then you just copy that template every time you start a new project and you just put stuff in the right place and then it's easy to organize. That's how I do it. Um, and then stick to that because it's going to speed up your, your workflow a bunch. Okay, so back to the program and let's see what we have here in terms of a scene. Uh, so I can just start to break it down a bit. Um, yeah. But just to, to kind of end that whole thing, uh, the reason why it's important to think about the scenes that you shoot in that way is because otherwise you're wasting time and you're shooting very ineffectively. And every time that you get funding and stuff, you have to be so resourceful with what you have. Like it costs much more than you get paid all the time, every time. So if you don't learn how to be more effective with what you do, you're gonna waste a lot of money and time to do your passion projects rather than making a living off it and that's like the essence of it i guess look at Werner herzog he makes a lot of films um, and i don't know why he has to but yeah he does it so he probably has to okay so let's look at this scene it's just basically it's not much of a scene to cut so i thought i would just uh, try to break it down first, uh, but it's basically him coming home. It's various shots here. All this was shot by Maddie, I think. Uh, and it's just us, b a little bit introduction to uh, to him, like us talking to him. Uh, some inserts of his place, really nice place, which he's leaving. And then he's actually um, going out shopping wood i think somewhere here and then he starts playing his guitar and after that after a while there's like an interview going on so i'm not gonna log the interview because that feels like um, it's just gonna be dreadful to see i might start doing it but as you can see here i've synced it already so what i'm usually shooting uh, with is uh, electrosonics pdr which is a, a lavalier that one has like one track which is lower one track which is a bit higher so you have some safety and that was really good here because we have the the music and then you have him talking so you have coverage for for like both levels and then we have maddie's onboard mic uh, on the camera so you actually need to mix that a bit now because it's so different in levels um, but other than that, I think this is pretty straightforward as a, as a scene and everything. Yeah. So what I'm thinking here is just to, to like create a small scene here where we come to his place and then he maybe shops the wood and we get like an introduction to him while he also plays his guitar. And now that I know, because I didn't know this when we were shooting that he was going to be moving out and we were going to be shooting that today so now i know what's going to happen and i know the progression so now i can try to kind of think about that while i edit this and try to think like okay so what's relevant here it's actually like showing him establishing him and then he will have to move later on in the story so how do we build up towards that and make that feel like you know unnecessary or something that's uh, yeah not nice for him um, that's what i'm thinking so but uh, let me just take some questions first before i move on and ramble forever uh, all right so what are you editing on davinci resolve uh, i always edit on davinci resolve but I, i'm not like a, i don't feel like it's one program suits everybody 
Like it, it all depends on what type of programs you use. If you work a lot in After Effects, then Premiere makes more sense. If you work a lot with uh, Final Cut, then like jumping to resolve without like wanting the color grading, I feel like that's the main reason you would jump to resolve. That's at least for me why I jump. Now it's a full-fledged program that can replace all of the Adobe video uh, apps so for me it's like it's a no-brainer but for other people if you have a favorite I don't judge I just feel like Final Cut crashed when I was m doing Final Cut uh, editing on the Pearl of Africa after like 40 minutes of a timeline it just started crashing so it took probably an hour an hour and a half sometimes to open the project in the end that was not something I wanted to do again, so I just left that. I have worked a lot in Premiere as well, uh, but mostly I think that like the UI in Premiere just it sucks. It's so unintuitive, uh, and it's just a lot of stuff in the way, and it, I liked Final Cut better in terms of a UI, but then uh, Resolve is like a blend of the two, I feel. Um, so that's just my opinion, but anybody that falls in love with one program will not always want to switch so I get that but if you would like to switch you have keyboard shortcuts that you can <laughs> actually uh, use from Final Cut or uh, from uh, Premiere and Avid probably also uh, just like a basic setup that you can use so that makes sense for me to try it out at least um, okay so visuals any tips on speed up the first rough cut when dealing with a lot of footage so my first question in terms of that would be did you edit scenes first um, because that would speed everything up uh, first of all because if you edit straight away you edit something that's just like okay a timeline and then you start editing the story that's very hard to to move stuff around and and to play around with the narrative uh, I feel like that's like a it's a very ineffective way of working you might like oh it's nice to start editing but then all of a sudden you feel the drag and things become slow because you can't change things easily when you have each scene that you can just like play around with move around it becomes a bit more easy to play around with things and and I just like moving around things on post-its or for the Pearl of Africa I printed these um, it's just like cards for each scene so to just understand where I am so for instance on the hill title and then I would just put them up on a foam board or something um, and that just helps it helps to speed up the process and that's what it's all about for me to speed everything up uh, but other than that, it's just edit all the scenes, that's the boring part, you understand things easily then, and then from that you can just start putting together a narrative. But I think also you need to kind of understand as early as you can what the narrative is. Uh, but the first rough cut that you do is usually something that you would throw away in terms of like, that's not close to the finished product. Uh, for the Pearl of Africa we had like five or so different journeys that she was on, like trips, uh, traveling, and we had to like throw that away, cut out everything that showed that it was different trips, and then uh, like switch it around and make it into one journey only, and then that became like one emotional journey for the audience and for her, and then it's easier to, to grasp the story so that became like the story theme uh, in a way and I think that's what you need to figure out and you do that by having all the material kind of laid out in front of you and then you uh, yeah, ask yourself what am I doing here and yeah that's how I would go about it at least mm, okay so Is DCP format on Resolve 15 correct? I don't know. Or because I didn't use I used Open DCP when I did Pearl of Africa. So I don't know how the built-in one is. Open DCP is a free 
version that you can use. Uh, you export one file from DaVinci Resolve and then you convert that into a DCP. It takes like forever, it probably took a week for the Pearl of Africa, but that was free. So if you have a week to spare, then that could be an alternative, I guess. Um, but I feel like anything like that that's free is, is good to try out before you buy something. If you would do it often, then it doesn't make as much sense, I guess. Uh, Vesa Pelton, and this may be not to the point of this video, but I would like to see how you color correct and grade a scene where the guy is sitting and playing guitar inside the windows on the background. Yeah, I can probably do that another time. Because um, I think I was planning to do like a color grading live stream in like two weeks or something. So I can probably do that then. Um, because this is interesting because this is a hard shot. Um, like I would prefer to underexpose this much more, I think, because I don't think that even this camera has the leverage that you need for a shot like this. You can just see here. You got some minor detail, but not a lot. So I would probably have like exposed it somewhere al around here in terms of the face to actually have more information uh, in the window oh now I'm not showing you this okay so sorry here we go so this is him uh, here you can see the window if I drag it down you don't see uh, much details so for me I would probably have exposed it somewhere around here in terms of his face to get more of the window that would mean that like everything would have been somewhere around here I guess and then I would have bumped that up because you have the, the leverage when you shoot on cameras like this um, but when you have a situation like this you would have to go for this as a style and then that becomes like you can't get more detail however you do it you can't get more detail so then you need to kind of work with with that um, yeah All right, so let's see. What happened? It broke my, here we go, on this Mac. Hmm, okay, so I had another question. I thought I'd go into that as well, which is, when filming a documentary, you may be filming a lot. No, that one uh, wasn't it. Hearing about the process, how you're assessing interviews, setting them up. So JSP Visuals asked this. So what's the process about like uh, making the interviews? And uh, I don't like doing interviews. Like I much more prefer to be talking to them and having it natural. And I think this is a. a case of that if I switch over and I can show you how uh, this scene is basically like this so this is going to break down how I would go about an interview I would try to have like a natural uh, progression of like okay so filming him just letting the camera roll we would just be with him talking a little bit here I can just turn on so I can It's basically just small talk for a while uh, and him showing his plays is just an introduction of some sort to him and, and to our relationship with him. So when you get that, you start to direct a little bit more. So what happens is we direct him so that he goes out shopping some wood um, here and then after that uh, I just ask him like curiously uh, oh I saw you have a guitar can you play something for us uh, very not uh, like it's it's very plump but it's also something that actually gets him to do it so then he plays the guitar it's actually us just following along that and then once that's done, once he's had that, we get, we get him into kind of a mood where he's more receptive to be talking 
that's when we do the interview and we start talking and then that kind of ends the the day but it's much more about like getting them into a headspace where you can get something that's intimate and and uh, uh, special than having it like in the start and that happens when they start to forget about the camera i feel so that's how i went about it in this one um, but i can just show you some from the interview and you can get a feel for it Yeah, so I'd, I'd say that like when you work that way with interviews, you kind of get uh, you get a little bit more out of the the interview I feel than if you just like sit down and you do an interview, because you've already talked about some of these things. You already kind of fished for angles to talk about, and you've already gotten to know the person before. So the the way that I usually think about it is to do the interview last, just because that will give a more um, like a deeper interview because you've spent more time with the person and they know you better and it just becomes more natural I feel uh, now I don't know how like at, at this stage that we're doing interviews it's also about understanding the person it's not only about like doing the interview to have a story to tell through the interviews I think it's much more to kind of think about it in research as well so i might do longer interviews than i would like even imagine using in the story but you have to kind of do that to find the story so that's how i approach it and then i try to everything that's being said i try to avoid as much dialogue as i can in terms of interviews but you always want that as a backup and you want it to to understand the story and to learn uh, what it's about um yeah you don't hear anything of the interview how weird let me see look back you should hear let me see oh what's happened to this one that it's priceless okay now let me play you again. A little magic balance for themselves. Uh, it feels kind of like it's like a bullying mentality. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A bullying, and a lot of it's fueled by money and artificial sense of prestige and looking down on, like that. Some people call us hippies, call hillbillies, dirty, whatever. But we live here. This is our home, and we find a way to make it work, and we look after it for everyone. And sometimes people forget that. You know, if you come flying up from the city, you have big city expectations, and, you know, you basically want to leave, you know, what prints all over the place and head back home. Well, you know, we have the best form of entertainment going. You know, we've learned to laugh about that. It's priceless. <laughs> You know, it's human nature and it's vilest sense, but you have to. Yeah, okay, so that's just something that I thought would be kind of interesting to show you how I think about the interviews, because it's, it's kind of crucial to have the interviews and to feel them out and to, to kind of also get to know the people through doing the interviews. Because usually you don't have that much time with people and you don't have time to talk everything through. Like they are usually, uh, pretty natural talking to you and you're just hanging out and that's where I want them to be but then you need this kind of sit down thing eventually and we can also have a look at the other 
interview that I did with the paddling. Uh, let's see here. I haven't cut this, so I think I have only the interview synced somewhere here. Okay, it's probably in here because it's ongoing. Yep. Uh, so for the canoe, I'll just show you what the timeline is here. So it's basically just going to the place. So this is what the scene is like. Uh, on the way there, I shoot some like 60 frames per second. It's basically just trying to capture as much alternative stuff that you can uh, when you have the chance. And usually like something riding in the car that can make up for a good like slow motion type of effect. Um, so it's not that I'm against slow motion, it's just that it's so freaking overused. Uh, it's just mainly traveling, 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 capturing shots like this on the way, trying to get that uh, to be able to cut together a scene with him talking or just driving. You never know what's gonna be the scene. And then like I see this place when we're going with the car and I'm just like okay so can we go out for a second and then just uh, shoot uh, a scene here because it's such a nice view. Uh, and it's not that it's just a nice view but it's a view that actually shows uh, the whole place and the scope of the place in a in a one shot so you don't need that much to tell the context so that's why i wanted to like go to this place and also to have something that can be used in between stuff if we have an interview or something with him like thinking or something like that this is the type of scene that can make up for that uh, and this can be cut in like any way, but it, that's just the, the thought of it. And then we continue with the other scene because that's uh, not going to be the same thing. We get to the place, he has to uh, get the canoe, that's what he does. He looks for a place to paddle there, he doesn't find it, he continues, he has to put it on, on the roof. And we follow this whole action until we get to the place where he actually can ride the canoe. Uh, and we have a couple of moments here, which is pretty magical, like this, for instance. Let me see. Somewhere here. Is it this? <laughs> Cherish them, though. Yeah. Uh, here. <laughs> or after this, maybe? Right in. It's just him waiting. Camp and I got along like a. I think it's. We just need to camp around. We don't want to take any chances. We always have a shotgun. We haven't seen any wolves. Nope. No, nothing like that. Um, yeah, we saw one black bear crossing in the lake. Oh, wow. Out that way once. Yeah, so it's just one of those like moments where uh, you get something with him as a character where you get something in his eye, you just get something that's priceless. But then, okay, he goes on, he starts paddling. I shoot for a while, him just paddling. Um, and then this interview happens. Uh, and it's just me and him fitting in this canoe. I mean, when, when you open up and start a mine, that's a constant issue. Is and before that, it's me and Maddie, different cameras. So basically, you want to try to like capture him in a in a setting like ideally this is how i go about it if i can i try to get him in the setting where the scene is playing out so in the canoe out here if i'm using something from this interview i prefer that it's in the place where the scene takes place now it might not be there so you might be wrong with that whole thinking if you want to use it somewhere else and you have the 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 sound of like him paddling or the water or something and then you have a scene where you don't have any water that could be an issue but i'm pretty sure that it's going to be used in this context and 
uh, if it's going to be used like that I prefer that it's in that scene so you don't like jump out to an interview uh, shot in like okay at his home uh, because it becomes more organic I feel if, if you can get it into the scene so that's how I thought about that at least uh, and that whole scene is pretty much just him out fishing uh, and through that we get that understanding but I'll just play a little bit so you can see what uh, the fishing I guess is aggressive fish. They're tasty. Back in the hole. Okay, so a scene like this, if I can, uh, I'm always trying to get him to talk about uh, what it's th that the scene is about, which is basically the the polluted water and and the environment in general. So, if you can get him to be out there, he's fishing and he's doing that. And then all of a sudden you start to talk about fish. This is something that you can cut together, but ideally it would be something that comes natural and he just says it. So you actually just want to instigate him to talk about, uh, for instance, uh, how the water is polluted. And in the most simple way that can be edited together with him just being there fishing. And then he starts to talk about that. That's how you want it to feel. Um, and when you do that, it doesn't feel like dialogue or interview. And that's what I'm after, at least in terms of aesthetics, because I feel like you get more into the story when you're working like that, rather than having like, okay, interview. Because um, it throws you off as an audience. Now, I'm not totally against interviews, because sometimes you can use it for an effect to actually get like a person looking even into the camera or something. You can get an effect from that, but to have it throughout, like as a narrative, uh, like the base of a narrative, that doesn't make sense to me. So it's it's more of like a a lazy way of telling stories, in my opinion. But like some people like that style, I don't like it. I think it's just not using the cinematic language enough. Um, but it could also be another way of doing this to get like more organic. Uh, discussions when you have for instance two people you can and this is something that I've stolen from another director so don't sue me but this is because I used to work as a DP so this is the best thing that I've taken from another director and just shamelessly taken to my own mm, when you direct people when you're two or whatever it is the most effective way to get your like dialogue to be organic is to actually direct them to talk about something. So rather than asking them questions, ask them to talk about something in between each other. So for instance, if they did this X number of years ago, tell them to talk about that again or ask them to talk about it in between each other and forget about the camera. Then you'll get more organic type of, of dialogue and you'll still get like the narrative will be pushed in the direction that you want but you won't get that feel of like this being an interview that's usually how how I would go about it now most of these people have been alone so we haven't shot like that yet but that's how I, I always go about it when I have more than one person and that's how you should also think about it like as a resource so try to get other people into it to be able to do that as well so don't just film like one individual because that's gonna 
demand much more of you to tell stuff cinematically through just action and then you might be forced to do more like interview driven stuff um, did you ever get him to redo anything in order for you to get coverage for example while he's fishing no but he did go out and paddle one last time just paddling for the drone that's the only thing I usually don't direct like that I, I think it's it's when you're a good DOP, it's much more like, f f as a director, it's much more about starting a, a scene and a situation to get people to do something that you want them to do. And then just capturing the images and taking them home to the edit bay. That's how I see it. Um, just instigate that situation that you want as a scene. And then you capture those images. And if you fail to capture that, then you fail, but you shouldn't fail. <laughs> Um, but then certain shots like for drones or if you want to do a car rig shot or something like that then you would have to kind of direct those things but I don't like okay can you do this again please I don't do that um, if that happens it's something that's very like it's not something that makes them uncomfortable I don't think I do that often but I can direct things like fiction that's a big difference I think because when you do reenactments with the people that you're filming it's a different vibe where you're just directing them solely to do something that's reenacting something that I can do but I won't like break up something like a scene that I'm shooting because it's something that kind of it breaks the mood of the scene and usually you you spend so much time to get them into a certain like headspace and as soon as you do that you pull them out of it so I would do that in a different way like for instance in the Pearl of Africa I directed them uh, to um, like I lit this whole scene with them just like think it's Cleo that's lying in Nelson's lap or something and that's just 100% directed it didn't happen at all probably happened but like in Uganda and they were in Kenya but that's something that you direct to get a certain type of uh, story across in terms of your narrative. And that I would say something different than telling, for instance, Scott in this scenario to like, can you throw the f fish hook out again? I wouldn't do that. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense though, because it's like contradicting totally. But anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that answered. Um, that whole thing but let me just kind of switch over to this at home scene and i can show you him playing here uh, at home sync should be the right one yep so i'll just start cutting this Oops, quarter. It actually does not like the C300 files. That's a big reason why I went with the Ursa instead, because the MXF files are so freaking slow. So it takes a while for them to catch up or the computer to catch up. There we go. so freaking slow it's probably also because i'm recording the audio and the stream but anyways you need to do this live right Uh, where 
me and Maddie shooting to get, uh, at the same time sometimes. Yeah, we were in the canoe thing before the before the canoe. We shot uh, two cameras, but then in the canoe it was too small <laughs> to be to be three people. So then it was only me. Um, and then before I think Maddie was alone sometime in a car as well. Um, I was alone with him first in a car and then he was alone, I think something like that. But it usually just comes down to what you're after. If we're doing an interview, it makes sense for me to go. If it's just um, capturing him uh, while he's uh, just going from point A to B, then it can just as well be just Maddie because I don't need to hear what he's, he's saying. Oops, audio. You probably don't want to look in there, it's a little messy. <laughs> movie magic, movie magic. Yeah. Well. And this this is just an example of like where do you cut? Do you cut where Maddie speaks or do you cut where the motion is? And I, I would say where the motion is. So I would just wait for So this is where we want to go in, I think. Probably there. Probably don't want to look in there. Probably don't want to look in there. It's a little messy. <laughs> movie magic. Movie magic. Okay, now we have some ND. Uh, okay. Movie magic. Yeah. Well, well, you know, you'll see it soon enough. Yeah. Okay, but there we have Maddie. So I'll cut a little bit earlier. Yeah. Well. You know, you'll see it soon enough. Somewhere there. Because that's easy to cut Maddie out in this case. So I wouldn't need that to be in. Or out, I mean. Oh, you'll see it soon enough. Woohoo, that's gonna be fun. Um. Okay, so since we're not going in the car, this is actually something that makes more sense to have in a different scene. So these two clips here. So I'll just move this straight away because it doesn't make sense to have him be in a uh, in the car. Uh, and I think the canoe or something similar makes sense. So I'll just put them in the beginning here. And this is something that you should think about as you do stuff. Like, okay, so where does this thing go? Uh, it makes sense to have it before because now you have like an intro of him going and then he's in the car and then he's going somewhere uh, now it could end up in a different scene as well but just pick those out as you're doing uh, a certain scene where it doesn't fit in because here you just want to have him uh, go home and be home uh, i'll probably start maybe with this we'll see Feels like that's a nicer shot to start with. Okay, anyways. This is probably not something special. It's just him talking, I think. So let's see. Okay, that's nothing. Just inserts. He used to trap, and he used to trap the same area that hung out all the time. I'll leave them because I know I will want to use them, but not sure where. He used to trap, and he used to trap the same area that hung out all the time. He liked it better here than over there. And uh, so him and his buddies hiding in his trap. Okay, he's just talking about how he got this place, so that's not interesting either. And uh, this is also B-roll stuff. I'll just keep this because I know that you will need something to to cut everything together seamlessly. This is also B-roll. And then this I'll just drag in.
Oh, <laughs> I'm pulling the wrong one. Before him, an artist used to live here. She lived in the house and used this as her studio. So I'd see all these paint cans. I think this is a bit off how much a frame or so. Now this is how I usually sync stuff. I just zoom in. And there we can see it's about a frame, I think. Maybe two. Probably two. Well, I mean, I mean the heat sort. Well, I mean the heat sort of comes. There we go. Perfect. So that's usually how I sync. You watch the <laughs> the waveforms for reference. Um, and then you uh, do the, your magic. Part of the history of the place. Okay, so this part is kind of interesting since we know from the storyline that he's going to move out of this place. So this clip I'm actually keeping because I know that he's talking about the place and how he got there and how he saw the place when he got the keynote the first time. So I'll keep that for now. Uh, and I don't know how I'll. I'll use it, but I know that it, it might be essential. So depending on like the material that I get back now, because I have uh, we have a secondary team in Kino, Matt isn't there either. Uh, so they'll shoot now for a couple of days. Uh, hopefully you can get like this narrative with Scott being built up, like he has to move out. Uh, and then it's gonna make sense what from this that we're gonna use so I'll just keep this for now just so that I'll know like when I get the other material how do I use it uh, so I'll just keep all of that or at least all the stuff that isn't all crap so let's see got the paint drips out but, um, but it was able to match the finish to this was all bare cedar and a bit of fur and this was all that was ever finished but uh, yeah it was just the guy that it was kind of heartbreaking the fellow who had passed away and he lived next door he started trying to fix this place up and he put all these little partitions in he was very frugal so a lot of these little studs they're spliced together he used every little scrap but he had he had the whole thing just okay let me just jump he, in this place, yeah. maybe, but I'm not worried. You know, it's, uh, I think people invest too much in a, a fixed notion of it has to be, and you lose the fluidity in your life. So I don't mind that. Hmm. It's like that. So you know, it would be a shame to leave, but I can't. Woo, bingo. Okay, so this is what you wanna want to keep so markers good thing to use uh, it would be a shame to leave I'm just marking out this because I know that this will for sure be something relevant so I'll just keep this and uh, continue to see what we have see. these are not something that's synced so I think we'll go with the camera audio for the wood shopping here do you need shoes uh, do you need shoes to go okay now you can hear me here but that will obviously be cut out in the final thing I had the axe with me for beaten posts okay, I'll just keep this so I can see the whole thing this I feel like I'm missing something here let's see ah, okay <laughs> it's been cut down Hmm, okay, let me regret cutting this out for a sec. 
because maybe I can find a place to sync this when I get everything out. So when I sync things and I don't have them, like the only reference point you really have is the waveforms. So you really need to like try to figure out like what what is all this, like what what's what. Now it's pretty easy if you look at the image, okay, so this is a slam, it's a door, okay, that's easy to understand. Here in the end you have similar things, so you would go, okay, here's a door, now let's just listen to the door and we can hear for reference. Okay. Oops, that's uh, solo. Oops, sorry. That's it. No, that's the daily routine when it's cold. Okay, that's the door. Or is it? No, it's the wood. Okay, that's the wood. So now you would look for something similar in terms of spike. Then we need that track as well. And that's it. That's how easy it is to sync something by hand. So, like, <laughs> I'm so confident <laughs> that I can figure it out that I don't even stress about it because it's not really demanding to do something like that. And this is basically like, okay, so it's a frame wrong or like it's plus one frame or back one frame, but this is probably it. That's the daily No, back one frame and it should be fine. Routine when it's cold. Let's just see somewhere else. Feels like it's a tiny bit off. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so here you can see the spike. It's probably that one that you need. So one more frame, maybe. Ah, okay, so it's just face. Sometimes you get like a face uh, problem. So a, a lab and a mic has different, I don't know what it's called, but how they record the audio uh, space. So they might sound a bit off. But they shouldn't be. Because when you zoom in, you get like, okay, so if we move one frame, that seems to be wrong and that seems to be wrong, so it should stay. Okay, that's basically how I would go about it. And it's like super quick to do. Now, I had already given up on, on syncing this, so that's why I, I cut the stuff out before, because uh, I felt it was too, uh, too much time for little effort. But now that I saw that it was a lot of stuff that I would destroy, or kill I thought well, let's just do it okay so now we have that whole thing and then we just compress that now this is is basically like a key part of this I'd say because him chopping the wood and everything is actually kind of a nice uh, progression where you can actually see him so you could in this whole scene you could go and start with this because this is something that's like just catching us in uh, action type of thing you get into his life straight away so either I would go about it that way I would use this to start the scene just establish him at home this is how he lives you would start outside maybe just chopping I also like the the audio that you get because it's so brutal so you get like an audience to really react straight away when you get a scene like that to start that way rather than like starting it him walking which was the start of this scene so you could start here or you could start with the, the wood scene or you could start with the music as well that's coming later but that's how you need to kind of think about it like what is the best part of this to to kind of start i would think that like just going into him just chopping is more of like people will react and and start thinking um or just like paying attention i'd say okay let's see if i can answer some question before moving along here mm. 
Could you explain the technique for one person to film an, a natural conversation, camera angles, who to record, when to get reactions? Uh, I'm staying away from footage that shows the panning back and forth. Yeah, I, I think that something that you need to think about is like, how do you how do you think about it as a, in perspective as a, a DP when you're thinking about the, the film? I would go about like an interview, for instance, and not shoot so much of the person talking. Like you want some things with the person talking, but it's easier to cut something if they actually aren't talking. If you instead focus on the person that isn't talking, that's easier to, to get to work. So I would think about it in a way where like essential things that you want the person to speak, you would film that person. Anything that isn't essential that you don't feel is going to be used, focus on the other person so you get those uh, those shots because it's not the same to shoot stuff afterwards which i used to do when i worked with tv for instance like they never become natural or anything when you have i've done this so many times uh, way back where you have like you ask somebody to just talk and like this is the way that tv works like talk shows and all that crap like you have somebody that's sitting right across from each other and one person is just talking, the other one is just listening and uh, it's always unnatural. Just try to get it while the scene is happening. Think about like how will you cut this, th this scene and then get the coverage for that. And I wouldn't go for hands or anything like that. Try to make it natural as a conversation piece. Uh, like think about what the scene is about and focus on those things. If it's about hands, or if like it's a trans person and they have nail painted and all those things like tell something with those inserts if you're doing those don't just cut to a hand to cut to a hand like have a purpose with it uh, or if it's like the location in itself do that but I would also think about changing angles so that you can cut it or have motion like those things can also help to, to shoot it uh, I would definitely avoid, you know, panning all the time and doing those quick movements because that's what the editor will keep in. And I just hate that all the time when I was leaving my material to somebody else to edit. And those were always the stuff that they used. Like, always. 100%. Always the zooms and all that ugly stuff that I tried to keep out. So try to not do those if you don't want them. Um, do you regularly use J cuts? I do sometimes. It kind of depends on what you try to to do with the uh, with the narrative. Like sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it feels like it adds something. Uh, other times it doesn't. Uh, when you edit a documentary for TV, what codec do you render in, and how many frames per second is it? It all depends on what. Uh, TV station it is and if it's uh, is it VOD or if it's TV or where is the end product they usually have the specifications for everything where like okay it has to be sound mix at this level it has to be this format uh, usually it's like for TV it can be like uh, MXF files um, for instance or it can be it's rarely ProRes files sometimes it can be that they have Avid so it's uh, DNX files can be all kinds of files so sometimes they do accept ProRes which is nice uh, when editing what decibels do you aim your actor voice uh, on typical talking scene uh, like usually I want to be at like minus 12 to minus 6 on, on voice uh, I usually mix everything but I don't do that while I, I edit like the rough cut because it just takes time but I do it as soon as like I'm past that. I start doing like a soft mix. That's basically how I think about it anyways. Okay, so let's go back to this. Okay, so I'm keeping this and I think this is gonna go in the beginning. And now let's see what he says when he comes in. Yeah, these are great stores. That's what I cook on in the winter. Or oh, you do? 
Wow. It's always on, or does it get too hot to always have it on? No, it's just, it's, it's on. Yeah, this is probably not necessary. Um, I might go back to some of these sometimes, but actually, let me just do this. Let me do um, like this. And then I'll cut this out later. And the reason why I do that is because I want to have the synced version that I have here. I want this to be just like the roughest, not anything like cut out. So I'm not cutting this stuff down because I want this to be like the something that I can go back to. So the next step would be like to iterate this and, and cut it down even more. So that's why I'm keeping this now and then I'll throw it away. Nice even, even, even. And this is a nice shot, I feel, so I'll just keep that. Man, I hate when there's so many layers or tracks. Same with that one. Can you play us something? Yeah. Um, those two are tuned kind of similar, but a little different. I haven't actually had anything creative in a long time, but I started getting a little uh, sort of a mood piece just staring out at, out at the mountains there. It's kind of nice, but I'm trying to take it somewhere because I have to go for my mom's memorial this spring or later this summer. And I'd like to play a song for it, but I haven't quite got it there yet. Okay, so as much as you can, you really want to have... This is the first time that we're here. It's the... Like, we shot three days. So, those days is pretty much all about like just getting to know the people so the stuff that you get is usually kind of limited in terms of of how natural it feels um, I would say that like those days you can't really leave them to just be and just be a fly on the wall if you want them to open up in that short amount of time so for us it was important for this trip that we first of all got the material that we wanted for the pitch stuff that we do uh, and then we got everything that we needed for the crowdfunding campaign and, and then we got the introduction to the, the people. So when you do that, I feel like it's important that you talk a little bit more uh, with the people to build a relationship. And for, for this, uh, this is a typical scene like that, like if I could pick this scene would be like me not talking at all. It would just be him walking around, taking up his um, uh, his guitar and doing all that without talking to me. But when you're in that situation and you try to get people confident and, and comfortable, uh, especially with you being there with the camera and wanting you to come back the next time, for that it's an investment. So you need to kind of balance that if you're trying to make a film like that. Like, Is it worthwhile just leaving him or is it worth investing in the relationship? That's something that you need to kind of decide. Uh, for this, like, you have to think about it in, in like what's best for the film. Uh, but in this case, I, I preferred to like get to know him over shooting it like I would shoot it otherwise. Yeah, I just thought that would be interesting to kind of see as you watch this again. Out at the mountains there, it's kind of nice, but I'm trying to take it somewhere because I have to go for my mom's memorial this spring, or later this summer, and I'd like to play a song for it, I haven't quite got it there yet. Okay, well, but this whole thing, you can see if you watch it closely i think you can see that uh, it's actually not that hard to cut his talking out and still get the scene you have a certain 
place here. This is the only place where his lips are moving. Quite got it there yet. So outside of that, you have his back. He's talking when he's walking there. It's I have to from here. It's totally fine because his beard is covering it. So you could sound design this to actually work. Uh, so I just thought I'd, I'd keep that because of it, even though it's a bit jumpy, because uh, you want that introduction to what he's um, what he's about to do, which is play the guitar, I think. So long it's just a kind of a theme, I guess. And then you would cut that out and you would end up here, I think. So let me just do that to... Auto save. Hate auto save. Uh, okay, and then we have the zoom, the ugly zoom that no DP in the world would want. Cut that away. Okay, and then there, and then. I started getting a little uh, sort of a mood piece just staring out at, out at the mountains there. It's kind of nice, but I'm trying to take it somewhere because I have to go for my mom's memorial. Okay, so probably this is not necessary. I'll just mute it for now. This cabin has, I like the acoustics. Okay. I like the acoustics. Not so good in terms of the footage here, but what he says about I like the acoustics feels relevant if we're trying to talk about like his place that he might have to leave. Then it becomes interesting to, to kind of build that together with him playing. So that becomes like a part of that story. Because otherwise, if you don't keep that, let me just play it again so you can hear it. Okay, let me actually just play this one, which is the good audio. Oh. But this cabin has, I like the acoustics in here, they're, they're really nice. And this is kind of an inspiring little view. Yeah, just any time of the year. I ended up tuning this, I normally play an open. Okay, so, so when you see that, I think that you can you can kind of sense that if you can use that to build up like him wanting to be in this place. So all that we want to show with this scene is going to be like, okay, he wants to be in this place. It's it's his like cabin that he loves, and then he, this is where it might end, where him he's playing and he ends with like this is inspiring. That's how I would probably build it up. But this is just like the first time I watch it and think about how I would structure the scene. Um, but just to kind of summarize it up um, before we leave. But first, thanks Gary Lane for the super chat. Uh, hey Johnny, thanks for always bringing the value. Hate to interrupt your workflow, but when using Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K for a doc, would you use ProRes or RAW? I think you have two things to think about. Do you want to pull stills? Then I would shoot raw. Do you intend to add noise in post? Then I might also shoot raw because it, it looks so organic that you could actually do it in the camera and, and it would be fine. Um, if you want a clean image and you don't want to do all the processing that you need to do with the computer to get the noise away because all raw formats need to, to denoise, then I would shoot ProRes. The downside to shooting ProRes is that it's only ProRes HQ, so you lose a little bit of latitude. So if you feel like uncomfortable in terms of dynamic range, I would go with the RAW as well. 
but in terms of like the cleanest image you're going to get that with ProRes because it has like a superior noise reduction algorithm that's the same that the Blackmagic RAW uses uh, so ideally you would use Blackmagic RAW but it doesn't exist yet on the camera um, so I would just think about like what's right you do get some more space if you shoot ProRes as well but that's because it compresses so it's not really like it's it's tricking you to think it's a good thing but it's <laughs> it's not really so i don't know i've shot a lot on on uh, prores that's what i've shot uh, just because i feel like it, it creates such a clean image that you don't need uh, to have the um, the noise that you get when you do remove it in in uh, in resolve it has to be set at like the the finest detailed modes like enhanced or something which takes a shitload of time to render so if you think about it in time saving i would shoot prores and and it still holds up it's totally clean to grade and, and to push and everything so it's kind of hard to say which one it depends on on especially if you want to pull stills that's the biggest reason why i would shoot raw if you want to pull stills uh, yeah so let me see here uh, 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 this whole scene let me just think about how I would assemble this for a sec I will start with him either coming home through this this is probably kind of nice well apparently I left it in mail <laughs> So either that or just straight into something like that or the wide shot in the end. I might not be might not be a wide shot where he's actually with his axe. Yeah, but I'll probably start with this and then I would go into the the place where he's at and here I would kind of establish him how he found the place. And a fellow had bought it. Um, he came here from Britain and he died. So I'd, I'd kind of pull something like this and maybe with like these inserts that we had here have him start talking about it so like start with this him chopping maybe he starts to talk while he's doing that we start with this he talks about like how he found the place we get some inserts of like showing him living in the place showing him as a character and then from that you would go and kind of catch up with him uh, with the guitar and everything for my mom's memorial this spring or later this summer so this dialogue like wouldn't go in song for her, but it would just be this like uncommented mm. this isn't really a song and then you would kind of start somewhere has, here i like the acoustics in here they're they're really nice and this is kind of an inspiring Positive. little view yeah just I think that's like how I'm thinking of this now and I'm just saying it before I cut it just because I have to go to bed but that's how I'll, I'll uh, assemble it and then when I have that I'll kind of show this and, and talk a little bit more about it when I've got somewhere but that's just like my process is usually like that you watch the material you try to think about like okay what's the order of things uh, you try to like arrange this so I'm just gonna arrange this quick so I don't forget for like the next time that I'm gonna do this so first off is the shopping of wood so I'll just move that to the start cut that out move everything with alt Y paste it in and then this I know that I will be using uh, let's see okay so the idea is that this 
will be layered over this but I'll put them actually I'll put them this is not going to be used I'll just put them like this so I know how I'll use it and I'll turn those off oops sneaky these are not going to be used put them in the end just in case I change my mind later on and this I'll just cut this out actually I have this timeline somewhere else I can use to get the synced timeline later okay so that's basically how I thought about it now I would have to sit down and edit this but that's gonna be the next time and then this whole interview is also something I need to log but next time um, so I know some someone asked earlier about crashing I don't experience resolve crashing but I do now for instance when I'm recording um, the stream to the computer and I'm recording the audio as well to the computer then I'm experiencing some lagging but <laughs> I think that's that's pretty understandable and I'm also using loop back to loop the audio and I'm streaming with OBS so I can understand that it's a bit sluggish for that but I think that the reason why Resolve might crash can be like hard drive speed it's it's a bit like bad at telling you that you have to uh, fix your hard drives or use SSDs or like faster drives so I would look into that and see if that's something that could be the case. Could also be that the computer is, is not fast enough. Um, but in general, I feel like Resolve is a much more stable program than most programs. Um, but they have massive issues if you don't have the minimum. Like there's a level to where it works really good. And then below that, not at all. So most programs won't <laughs> do that. But this program does um, and it can become sluggish if you don't do like optimized media or if you don't do like I do now. Um, even though I'm doing the proxy mode, uh, it's sluggish, but that's because it's recording stuff and this is 4K uh, 12 bit, So it's too heavy to be doing that at the same time. It's actually writing to the same RAID that I'm editing from so that's not very clever either um, but yeah it shouldn't be sluggish um, let me just see because I know that there was a question from Alex Carl let me see if I answered it I would find it great if you could explain how to find and tell a story in short docs Okay, so this is interesting to end on. Uh, when I do films for brands, it's usually like short docs. That's one of the hardest things to do with your um, artistry intact when you come out of that. So the way that you can kind of work around working with brands is to embody everything for instance into um, to the stories you have to the same way that you think about like the the person that you're trying to tell a story about um, when you cast someone you're trying to get it cinematic through like okay location uh, the story the conflict all those things the same way you need to approach like branded docs uh, or short docs with brands um, when you do it you need to think about the brand in a similar way where the brand has to have all the same values and and all the cinematic qualities that you can imagine for your film to have all those things need to be embodied or like blended well with the brand for it to work and not feel like unnatural so that's like one aspect of what I do another aspect of shorts which we're doing right now is developing shorts for Swedish TV 
and then we have like a limited set budget so for instance we have maybe like two to four days to shoot a documentary of like 15 to 20 minutes and we're doing probably hopefully a couple of them um, then you need to think about like how do you frame the ID so that it's realistic to shoot it that way so how do you do like how do you create a story that is doable with those restraints and for us it might be for instance uh, okay so you follow an inmate the day he or she gets released from prison and you follow that I don't know the day before or the day that it happens or whatever it is you try to set a conceptual limitation for yourself or let's say we're following a, a left and a right wing and you follow them as they are doing a march on a certain day of the year and you follow both sides during two days something like that you have to come up with a concept most of the time to be able to like shoot in a short amount of time and then that like concept can aid in you being able to like focus in on a shorter time span because usually the best docs are the ones that are shot for like a long period of time and with short docs you need to kind of rethink that and kind of think of it more conceptual and less following life as it happens and trying to follow this character you could do that but one of the best like films that show that i feel is for instance you can watch is it is it elliot rice i don't know what it's called but it, it's a dog film like a short doc it's old but it's a good example of somebody that's made a film the last day of a dog when he's, he's being put down somebody in the comment section must know which film this is so elliot rausch is that what it's called let me check this uh, anyway if if you think about that film or watch that short film it's basically following a uh, owner of a dog um, as he's putting down his old dog which is his best friend so he's basically like having to put his best friend to sleep uh, and that is like limiting the whole time span of everything so you're following yeah i think this is it dog um last minutes with odin is what it's called so watch that one it's from 2009 so it's old but if you think about that film as a, as a framing of like how you would think about it like when you do a short doc you need to kind of frame it in in a way that is a limited uh, time span and a, a form of like a story world that isn't everything that you could tell because you have this great character but it needs to be like narrowed down to much smaller than that in terms of what type of story world you're trying to tell for short talks i think that's what how i would kind of uh, explain it not the best explaining uh, 